The subject of the message today is one of the most important subjects you will ever consider. Every person in this worship center, every person upon this campus this morning, this is the most important subject you will ever consider. In fact, I would be so bold to say every person upon planet Earth or has ever been upon planet Earth, this is the most important subject they could ever consider. And so I'd like to ask you to take your Bibles and I'd like to direct your attention this morning to Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 and 28. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. The writer says, Inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes the judgment. It is appointed to men to die once, and after this comes the judgment. So Christ also, having been offered once, notice die once, Christ offered once. Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly wait him. Christ came the first time to offer himself for the penalty of our sins. He will come a second time to bring salvation to everyone. There is an old legend which tells of a merchant in Baghdad that one day sent his servant to the market. And before long, the servant came back. The servant was white and trembling and in great agitation. And he said to his master, Down in the marketplace, I was jostled by a woman in the crowd. And when I turned around, I saw it was death that jostled me. She looked at me with, and made a threatening gesture. Master, please, please, lend me your horse, and I must hasten to avoid her. I will ride to Samaria, and there I will hide from her, and death will not find me. So the merchant lent his horse to him, and the servant galloped away in great haste. And later the merchant went down to the marketplace. And he saw death standing in the crowd. And he went over to her and asked, Why are you, have you frightened my servant this morning? Why did you make a threatening gesture? Death said, That was not a threatening gesture. It was a start of surprise. For you see, I was astonished to see him in Baghdad. I have an appointment with him tonight in Samaria. This text points out two important truths. Two important truths. And this is why this is the most important subject you will ever consider. Number one, it says, verse 27, death is a reality you cannot avoid. Where I am in my life, I learn this more and more. I tend to read the obituaries more these days. Death is a reality you cannot avoid. It will be an appointment every person will keep. There's only two individuals in the past and one group in the future that will not experience physical death. Two individuals in the past that did not experience physical death. Enoch, Genesis 5, 24 says, was so close in his relationship with the Lord, so honoring to the Lord 
that the Lord just took him to heaven. He never experienced physical death. Elijah, 2 Kings 2.11, was so walked so closely with the Lord, was honoring to the Lord. And it says that God sent a chariot of, of, uh, of fire and animals pulling that chariot of fire and took him to heaven. That must have been a memorial service like you've never seen. In the future, 1 Corinthians 15, when the Lord comes back for his church, 1 Corinthians 15 says, those who are alive, the believers who are alive at that time, will literally be transformed to their glorified body in a moment. They will not experience physical death. Every time I read that passage, I, I say to myself, oh, I hope, I hope, I hope I'm a part of that group. <laughs> but my friend, death is a reality. You cannot avoid it. We are reminded of that every day of our life. It is an appointment every person will keep. And then the second truth that teaches this, and this is really good news, but it's important news. There's only one way to have victory over death. And he tells us in verse 28, through Christ and Christ alone. There's only one way. We hear a lot today, have you noticed uh, you're listening to the news or, or you're watching something else and they talk about people of faith? Well, what's wrong with that is the only faith that will save has the right object of their faith. And that's Jesus Christ alone. We, our, our society tends to think, well, you, you can just have faith in anybody, and that's good enough for God. No, it's not good enough for God. Jesus was very, very exclusive in, in, the, in the claims he made. He claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be the only way of salvation. There is no plan B. There is no other way. So it's not enough just to be a person of faith. A religious person. You, your faith has to have. So death is a reality you cannot avoid. It's an appointment every one of us will keep. Every person will keep. And there's only one way to have victory over death. And that's through Jesus Christ. Now what I want to do today. Is give you six biblical facts about death now I know I know this is not a popular subject my friend but it's a very important subject I mean I know that most of us and most people they don't like to think about it I mean uh, when's the last time you called your friend and said Hey, why don't you come over to the house? We're going to have pie and your favorite beverage and uh, talk about death. No, we don't do that. But see, I want to remind you, our enemy, Satan, doesn't want us to think about it. Because if you avoid it, if you avoid thinking about it, if you avoid dealing with it, he's got you. So I want to share with you six biblical facts. By the way, look at your outline there. My wife wanted to remind you these mistakes uh, on the title. It's death you cannot avoid, not common. Uh, and also six biblical facts. It's got six biblical fats. Huh? My wife wanted me to... Right, she's not responsible for that. Pastor Tyson's <laughs> responsible for that. Uh, apparently, he types like I do. He's probably even better than me, though. All right, six biblical facts about death we need to be reminded of. Number one, 
Death is the consequence of sin coming into the world. Death is the consequence of sin coming into the world. Why do we have all this stuff in the world? Well, it's because death and other things are the consequence of sin coming into the world. Romans 5.12 When Adam sinned, sin entered the entire human race. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone for everyone sinned. We are all born in the line of Adam. This is the reason we have death. Physical death. This is the reason we see the other thing. We live in a broken world. When sin came into our world, the result of that was a broken world. This is why we see sickness and disease. This is why we have, because of the curse upon nature, national catastrophe. This is why we have hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes and, and what other natural disasters. This is why we see violence. This is why we have murder and wars and conflict and relationships. Everything that God, good that God gave us, gave us, sin has destroyed it. And is continuing to destroy it. So death is a consequence of sin. Remember when God told Adam, uh, Adam and Eve that uh, you can eat from any tree in the garden, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden, the day you eat it, you shall surely, what? Die. Now, what did, what did he mean by that? Because did Adam and Eve die suddenly, physically? No. What happened immediately was spiritual death. Spiritual death, Ephesians 2, 1, where we are dead in our trespasses and sin. Spiritual death is separation from God. That's what happened immediately when they, when they brought sin into the world. So the immediate consequence was spiritual death. The long-term consequence is physical death, and that's what Hebrews 9.27 is talking about. It is appointed to men to die once. We are reminded every day of our mortality. Did you know that three people die every second? 180 people die every minute somewhere on planet Earth. Nearly, uh, nearly 11,000 people die every hour. This means that more than 250,000 people every day go to either heaven or hell. Every day. And this is what we call to those who don't go to heaven eternal death. So spiritual death happened immediately, separated from God. And that's why we need salvation. Physical death was the long-term result. And those who go through this life and die physically who do not deal with their sins, they will experience eternal death, Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15. When it's talking about the lake of fire, it calls eternal death. You will be eternally separated from the Lord in torment. You say, oh, man, that's pretty harsh. It shows you how bad sin is, my friend. Death and all the, the evil things we see happening in the world and all the catastrophes we see happening in the world, death and all these are the consequence of sin coming into the world. All right, let me give you a second 
truth. Death is a reminder of the brevity of life. Death is a reminder of the brevity of life. James 4.14 says that death is like a vapor. You see it, and then it's gone. Psalm 39 verse 5 says, Death is like the width of your hand. The brevity of life, the width of your hand. The life, it's like the width of your hand. Psalm 30, uh, 73, verse 20. Your li life on this earth, it, it's like a dream, he says. You have a dream, then you wake up. Job 14, 2 says, It's like the flower that blooms and then withers. 1 Peter 1, 24 says, It's like the grass that dies. Death is a reminder of the brevity of life. We don't have a lot of time on this earth. And my friend, that's why we shouldn't give a lot of time to things upon this earth. We should have an eternal perspective, a spiritual perspective. Why in the world would I give a lot of time to something that is going to last just a short while compared to eternity. Death is a reminder of the brevity of life. So that has an application both for the unbeliever and the believer. To the unbeliever, God is saying, listen, you're not going to spend that much time on this earth. You better make a decision. You better prepare for eternity. Today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. Today is the day of salvation. You may think you're going to live a long time, but it can be cut short very quickly. I'm, I'm very, very sure that many of those people that went to that country western concert in Las Vegas that night thought they were going to live a long time. And many of them died that night. So, if you're without Christ, my friend, listen. Put your trust in Jesus today. Don't put it off. Don't think about it anymore. Put, it, put your trust in Jesus today. And for us as Christians, it has this application. The brevity of life. This means, Christians, we don't have a lot of time to play games. If you're going to do something for Jesus, do it now. Don't put it off. Do it now. And we certainly don't have time to be frivoling around with petty things. Getting upset about petty things. We only have a certain amount of time to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to do it now. We don't need to put it off as a church, my friend. We need to do it now. So death is the consequence of sin coming into the world and death is a reminder of the brevity of life. Let me give you a third fact. Death does not distinguish between different ages. Death does not distinguish between different ages. You say, what about uh, little children? 
we were talking about this morning in our Sunday school class. What about uh, little children, small children who die? What happens to them? Well, my friend, I'm happy to tell you, they go directly to the Lord Jesus Christ. They go directly to heaven. You say, how do you know this? Well, I know it because of David. Remember David and Bathsheba? And after he confessed his sin, Bathsheba, you know, she was pregnant and they had a child. And the Lord took the child. David was praying that the Lord would save his life and give him to him, but the Lord took him. And afterwards, uh, his servants, he got up, washed up, and ate, and his servants asked him, why has there been such a change in your attitude? And he said, because the child cannot come back to me, but I can, what? Go to the child. Every precious little child who dies before a time of accountability, they reach an age of accountability where they're aware of their sin. Every child goes directly to the Lord Jesus Christ. The deaf does not distinguish between different ages. Luke 8, 42 and 49, a young girl, 12 years old, died. John 11, verse 11, Lazarus, Jesus' friend, who was in his middle ages, died. One month, I went through our newspaper in Merced. In this particular month, and I every day looked at the obituaries. During that month, a six-month-old child died. A child eight years old. A child nine years old. I saw teenagers obituaries, one uh, 30 years old, 50 years old, 60 years old, mid-70s, and one person was 101. Death does not distinguish between different ages. I know when we're young, we, we tend to think, oh, you know, I'm young. I got a lot of years left. Not necessarily And we need to keep that in mind. That's why we've got to deal with this subject. We've got to face the reality of it. And we've got to deal with our salvation. We have to prepare for eternity. Do you know what the purpose of life is? The purpose of life is twofold. To prepare for eternity and to glorify God. Death does not distinguish between different ages. So death is the consequence of sin coming into the world. Death is a reminder of the brevity of life. And death does not distinguish between different ages. Let me be a fourth fact. When a person dies, that person does not cease to exist. The Bible is very clear on that. When a person dies... That person does not cease to exist. Now, why is this so important to establish this fact? Because the normal atheist, if you ask the normal atheist, well, when you die, what happens? What do they say? Well, you just cease to exist. No, you don't. No, you don't. Look at, uh, in your Bibles, at Luke 16. Luke 16. The, Luke 16 is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. It starts in verse 19 and goes through the end of the chapter. Um, 
let me just read a little bit. Now, there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. This was a rich man. He dressed very well. He did not buy his clothes at J.C. Penney's. He dressed very well. He had everything he wanted. He had joyous living. And then it contrasts in verse 20 to a poor man named Lazarus who laid at his gates covered with sores and longing to be fed from the crumbs that were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sword. Terrible picture of this thing. Now, notice what happened. Now, the poor man died, verse 22, and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And so, both of them died. Rich man, what a contrast in life. And both of them died. And when the poor man died, he was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom, the place of pleasure, the place of paradise. But the rich man, when he died... He lifted up his eyes. He woke up in torment, being far away from Abraham. Notice, they didn't cease to exist. They kept on living. They both continued to exist. But the rich man... He had all the pleasures of this temporal life. But he didn't deal with this eternal situation. So, you don't cease to exist. You die. Here's something a lot of people don't understand, even a lot of Christians. The real person, the real person of you is in your soul and spirit. This body just it houses you, your real person. And our body is still flesh. One day God's going to give us a glorified body. But the real you is in your soul and spirit. And when you die physically, your body dies physically, you, that does not cease to exist. And later on, our soul, those who are saved, our soul and spirit will, will be in a glorified body. God completes our salvation. So that's one uh, Let me give you another illustration. Matthew 17, 1 through 3. Remember, this is when Jesus was transfigured. Peter, James, and John went up with him in, on the mountain, and he was transfigured right before their eyes. And as he was transfigured, Moses and Elijah come back and started talking to him. Moses and Elijah had died. They were gone. They were in heaven. They didn't cease to exist. They came back and talked to him. So death, when a person dies, they do not cease to exist. But this leads to the next fact. Death brings each person, death brings each person to one of two destinations. Death brings each person to one of two destinations. There's an Old Testament scripture on this and also one from the New Testament that I've given you. Daniel 12, 2. Multitudes who sleep, that's death, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. He's talking about the resurrection. Multitudes of sleep, who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to etern- everlasting life, that's one group, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Everlasting life, everlasting contempt. 
Matthew 25, verse 46. Matthew records, then they, that is those who die, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Eternal punishment, eternal life. Everlasting life, everlasting content. Death brings each person, each one of us, each person on planet earth when they die will go to either everlasting life or everlasting punishment. My friend, listen. This means there's no purgatory. There's no baptism of the dead. When a person dies physically, that's it. Hebrews 9, 27. It is appointed to men to die once, and after that comes what? The judgment. So there's no purgatory. There's no coming back in another form to a, a different life. There's no baptism of the dead. When you die, you either go to everlasting life, or everlasting death. Now these first five facts are bad news. But the sixth one is really good news. Really good news. And that is this. Death is certain, but it can be conquered. Death is certain, but it can be conquered. When the Lord, at the end of human history, the Lord, when the Lord comes back, He will redeem everything that sin has destroyed. Do you realize that? He will not only redeem our spiritual life, that we can have fellowship with Him all eternity, he redeems everything that sin destroyed. Sin has destroyed this body, so he will give us a new glorified body. Sin has destroyed our environment. He will give us a new heaven and new earth, a perfect environment. Sin has destroyed our city. He will give us a new, perfect, heavenly city to live in all the days of our life. Sin has destroyed relationship. We will have Perfect relationships in heaven. He will redeem everything that sin has destroyed. So it's certain it's an appointment you will keep. It's certain. But the last enemy, the last enemy of all mankind you can have victory. It can be conquered. He says this in 1 Corinthians 16, or 15, 1 Corinthians 15. Let me read verses 21 to 26. 1 Corinthians 15. So you see, Paul says, just as death came into the world through a man, he's talking about Adam, now the resurrection of the dead from the dead has begun through another man, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's comparing Adam with Christ. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given a new life. A new life. But there is an order. There is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all belong to Christ and will be raised who comes again when he comes back after the end after that the end will come and he that is Christ will turn the kingdom over to the God the Father having destroyed every ruler and authority and power he puts down all opposition but listen to this for Christ must reign until he humbles 
all his enemies beneath his feet. And the last enemy, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death is certain. But my friend, if you will put your trust in Jesus Christ, it will be conquered. On a bulletin board, on a bulletin board, and I want to close with this, at Mayo Clinic, in the cancer ward, Somebody put on the bulletin board this statement. Cancer is limited. It cannot cripple love. It cannot shatter hope. It cannot corrode faith. It cannot eat away peace. It cannot destroy confidence. It cannot kill friendship. It cannot shut out memories. It cannot silence courage. It cannot evade the soul. It cannot reduce eternal life. It cannot quench the spirit. It cannot lessen the power of the resurrection. My friend, listen. If you have the power of the resurrection and the hope of heaven, you don't have to be afraid of death. You don't have to be afraid. If you have the power of the resurrection and the hope of heaven, you don't have to be afraid of death. In fact, my friend, you don't have to be afraid of anything. It's an appointment. Every one of us will keep. You cannot avoid it. That's why I say to you, before I left this place today, I would make sure Jesus is my Savior. My friend, he's the only one that can help you. There are a lot of other people who say they can help you but they can't. He's the only one that can help you. And church, let's heed this message. It's time to be busy for the Lord. Don't put it off. If we're going to do something for the Lord, let's do it now. Let's be the church of Jesus Christ involved in the things that are dear to him, carrying the gospel of Christ to our generation. Let's do it now.